Well, thanks for the introduction, um, and thanks for inviting me to be a part of this fantastic event. I am very excited to be here. Um, I'm going to talk about a topic that has gained a lot of interest recently, as we have seen um, today, um, particularly interpretability in machine learning. Um, and I'm going to talk about how we can manipulate and measure model interpretability. Um, and this is primarily based on joint work with my Microsoft research collaborators, Dan Goldstein, Jake Hoffman, Jen Wortman one and Hannah Wallach. So, as I said, interpretability has gained a lot of interest recently. Um, and when I look at the landscape of research on interpretable machine learning, I usually think about it falling into two separate categories. Um, the first category is where people try to design models that are intrinsically simple. Um, so these can be decision trees or sparse linear models where you can see the effect of each input feature on the prediction that the model has made. Um, whereas another line of research focuses on coming up with post hoc explanations or visualizations for potentially complex models. So when we look at these approaches, it is natural to ask, but what is it that makes a model or a visualization or an explanation simple and interpretable? Um, and in fact, there's still quite a bit of uh, disagreement in the community on the meaning of interpretability and some recent position papers examine those issues. And on top of that, the fact that machine learning nowadays is used in many different scenarios by many different people with different needs, it just makes things more complicated. So for example, an approach that would work best for a regulator who wants to explain why an individual was denied a loan is going to be probably different than the approach that works best for a data scientist who is more interested to be able to debug a machine learning model. So uh, when we started thinking about this and gathering all the approaches, methodologies, and definitions that are proposed for interpretability in the community, um, we came to the conclusion that the reason that interpretability is hard to define is that it's not something that can be directly manipulated or measured. Rather, it is a latent property that is affected by factors such as the number of features that the model uses, the types of features that the model uses, whether the model is completely clear or it's black box, or whether the model is linear or not. And those, in turn, affect people's abilities to gain trust in the model, debug a model, understand where a model goes wrong, and simulate the model's prediction. Now, when we look at this picture, um, we see that while the factors While the factors that are commonly associated with interpretability are properties of the model and system design, the outcomes are properties of human behavior. So there's no surprise that most of the research that is coming out of the computer science community and in the machine learning community focuses on the left-hand side of the picture and mostly ignoring the right-hand side. So I want to argue that if we really want to understand interpretability, we need to take interdisciplinary approaches. We need to stop, start thinking about interpretability, we need to stop thinking about interpretability as this purely computational and technical problem and learn from amazing and great research from the sociologists and psychologists and all this research in decision making and human behavior and apply similar methodologies here to understand interpretability. So that's what we did. Uh, we particularly focused on two factors that people usually associate with interpretability. The number of features that the model uses and whether the model is clear or black box. And we ran randomized human subject experiments on Amazon Mechanical Turk to measure the effect of those factors on people's abilities to gain trust in a model, uh, detect the model's mistakes, and simulate the model's predictions. So the user experiment that we launched on Mechanical Turk was a predictive task where um, people had to predict the prices of apartments in New York City uh, with the help of a linear regression model. And so in addition to a baseline where users did not have access to a model to help them, 
we had two, four primary conditions in a two by two design where when people came in, they were randomly assigned to one of these conditions. So I don't expect you to see all the differences here, but I will point um, to the important points. So the models on top use two features, particularly the number of bathrooms of the apartment and the square foot of, of the apartment to make predictions. While the models in the bottom use all eight features to make their prediction. The models on the left are completely transparent. So the user can see exactly the coefficients of the linear regression model and what kind of math is going on behind the scene to make a prediction, while the models on the right are completely black box. Okay, so now, those are our four main primary uh, experimental conditions. Now, I want to emphasize something that is super important in our design here. So all the users in all the conditions see the exact same inputs, that is the exact same apartment features, and they see the exact same model predictions. So the only thing that is different across these conditions is what they see in between. And this is how we were able to run tightly controlled experiments. So because this is a short talk, I do not want to dwell on this a lot, but I just want to emphasize that it is incredibly hard to design tightly controlled experiments. But because of this design choice, we were able to associate any kind of difference in a human behavior across conditions to what they see in the model. So, um, the way the user interaction went was that first users came in, we instructed them on the whole task, and we took them to what we call the training phase, where they saw examples of apartments um, along with um, the model's prediction and the actual prices of the apartments, and they got familiar with how the model worked. And when they completed that, they moved to the testing phase, where they had to complete two steps. First, we showed them the model, and an apartment, and we ask them to simulate the model. So tell us what you think the model will predict for this, to get an understanding of whether they actually understand how the model is working. And once they did that, they saw the model's prediction, and then we asked them, okay, now here's what the model predicted, now tell us what you think the apartment sold for. So, you might have heard about the uh, replication crisis in the psychology, and um, because of that, a lot of people are nowadays encouraged to pre-register their hypotheses um, before running behavioral experiments just to prove that they are not just fishing for results in their data after they have uh, gathered the data. Um, so following that practice, we pre-registered three main hypotheses in this website as predicted before we ran the experiment. Um, so our first hypothesis was that, okay, people who see a clear model that has a small number of features, particularly two features, should better be able to simulate the model. We also hypothesized that people would trust the clear model with two features more than the black box model with eight features as sort of the two extremes that people usually think about in the interpretability spectrum. And third, we hypothesize that people's behavior will vary when they see unusual apartments where the model is making a highly inaccurate prediction. Okay, so we pre-registered our hypotheses, ran the experiment on Mechanical Turk, now we have the data, now we are examining our hypotheses. The first hypothesis was about people's ability to simulate the model. So we calculate simulation error which is the absolute deviation between what the user thought the model would predict from the model's actual prediction. And here, I am plotting the average simulation error for the participants in each condition. So what we see is that people in the clear two-feature model condition had on average lower uh, simulation error. So they had a better understanding of how the model works compared to the other condition. Moving on to our second hypothesis, which was about trust in the model. So to calculate trust, we um, calculated the absolute deviation from the user's prediction of the price of the apartment from the model's prediction. So the idea here is that if a user trusts the model, 
they will follow the model, so they would deviate less from the model's prediction. So lower values here will indicate higher trust in the model. And again, here I am plotting the average deviation score that I talked about um, per condition. And what we see is that um, contrary to what we had hypothesized, people um, just trust the clear two-feature model equal to the um, black box eight-feature model. Moving on to our third um, hypothesis, which was about people's abilities to detect the model's mistakes. Uh, we inserted this apartment at the end of the experiment, which has sort of weird configurations. It has one bedroom and three bathrooms. And because the model is putting a large weight on the number of bathrooms, it's going to predict a price that is inaccurately high, and we wanted to see how would people react to this apartment in the experiment. So on that particular one bedroom, three bathroom apartment, we again looked at the trust measure, the deviation of users' prediction of the price from the model's prediction. And so remember that here, the model is making a prediction that is inaccurate. So if a user has a better ability to detect that the model is making a mistake, they would deviate more from the model's prediction. So we want people to deviate more. So what we see is that it looks like people who see a completely transparent and clear model uh, are deviating less from the model's prediction. So um, apparently transparently is hurting their performance. So this was really surprising for us. Um, it went against anything we, a group of pro-interpretability people um, that we thought of. So we wanted to investigate more into this. And um, so we had two main conjectures of why this might be happening. Uh, the first conjecture was that, okay, so participants who see a completely transparent model might be getting overwhelmed by the model internals, which might in turn hamper their abilities to detect the unusual inputs to the model. So they might not even be noticing that the inputs are just weird. And the other conjectures that we were throwing around was about the anchoring effect, which is very well studied and established in psychology. And so let me tell you a bit more about this. So when we asked people to uh, predict the actual price of the apartment, they were presented with two previous predictions. The second one here is the model's prediction of the price, which, as I said, is exactly the same across conditions. But the first thing that they saw was their simulation of the model's prediction. And as I had shown earlier, people in the clear conditions were better able to simulate the model's prediction. So in the case of that weird apartment, their simulation of the model's prediction would have been closer to the model's inaccurate prediction. So maybe the anchoring effect towards that inaccurate prediction is just stronger in those cases, which is leading to um, their lower ability to detect the model's mistakes in that case. So having those two conjectures, we um, designed another experiment where we focused on people's ability to detect the model's mistakes. And what we did was that first, we provided these explicit attention checks um, where we said that, hey, this, is, this apartment has one bedroom and three bathrooms. This is weird. You should take that into consideration when you are going through this task. And uh, we also removed potential sources of anchoring that was leading toward differences across conditions by simply not asking people to simulate the model anymore. Again, we registered our hypotheses before running the experiment. Our first hypothesis was examining the effect of the explicit attention checks. And the second and third hypotheses examining the effect of the model transparency on uh, participants' ability to detect the model's mistakes in, uh, with and without the attention check. So here, um, I am plotting the actual prediction of the users on that particular weird apartment, with the horizontal line being the uh, model's inaccurate prediction. And so a couple of things that are going on. First, when we don't have the attention check, even when we remove the potential sources of anchoring, 
people in the clear conditions are still doing worse. When we add the attention check, all, both conditions, predictions are getting lower, which means that providing the attention checks was helpful. And interestingly, once we add the attention check, the difference between the clear condition and black box conditions goes away. So they get equalized. So now, let me quickly summarize the results that I just talked about here. Um, so first, we found that as we had hypothesized, uh, people who saw a clear model with a small number of features, basically a model that we usually think about as being simple, uh, people were better able to simulate the model's prediction and understand the model. Um, however, contrary to our hypothesis, we did not find any significant difference in people's trust in the model. And we also found that actually too much transparency was hurting people in terms of their ability to detect where the model is going wrong. And so this last um, finding that was surprising for us has potential implications for the design of machine learning based systems. For example, we can make this suggestion that you should probably not overwhelm users by um, throwing at them this very complicated, which was not the case in terms of linear regression, but even in that case, uh, you should probably not do that. Hide the internals and let them uh, get access to the model internals on demand rather than showing it by default. And I do want to finish by emphasizing the point that I made that um, interpretability is not a purely computational and technical problem. And um, as hard as it might seem for us as computer scientists to think about it that way, it's really not because we are dealing with humans and we need to learn from the research that is done in the fields that are dealing with humans, particularly sociology and psychology and decision-making research. Um, and we need to learn from them and apply interdisciplinary approaches to better understand interpretability. Um, the surprising results that I talked about emphasize um, the fact that the big picture of interpretability is much more complicated than it's usually thought in the community. And we need more empirical studies um, to get to that question. Um, the experiments that I talked about are replicable in one specific scenario, one specific subpopulation of people, and one specific domain, one specific regression model that I talked about. But I know that we are all interested about these other domains, scenarios, subpopulation of peoples, models, factors that affect interpretability, and all these human behavior as outcomes. And I think those are part of this very large research agenda that we are very excited to um, pursue in the future. And I just hope that the experiments that I talked about inspire more interdisciplinary work in the area. Thank you. I had reserved a big chunk of time to answer your questions, but I don't think that's how the format goes, but.